Hi everyone, welcome all to Seven Elite Academy online masterclass session. Uh, today we are joined by a very, very special guest. Uh, a guest that has played over 180 times in the MLS. A guest that is now currently part of the, the very exciting project uh, underway at Inter Miami, a player for them. And a player that has, has led his country out numerous times for the US. And that guest is Will Trapp. Will, thanks for joining us. It's a real pleasure to have you here. How are you, first and foremost? I'm great, and thanks for having me, man. This is uh, this is awesome. Um, keeping busy, keeping fit, doing everything I can to to be ready when the time comes. We can be back on the field. Brilliant. And also, Will, uh, as you as you can see on uh, online right now, uh, we've also got one of our staff members from Seven Elite Academy, which is David Mayer, who is the head of our foundation program. Someone that you know quite well, uh, I imagine, Will, from uh, back in the college days. Yeah, Dave and I were, uh, were, were teammates at the University of Akron, uh, and then he left us uh, after a, a year, but we've, been, we've kept super, super close over the past seven, eight years. So yeah, very, very close friend of mine. And that's brilliant. And, and what we'd like to do over this, kind of, over this masterclass session is, is you know, talk about your career, talk about kind of challenges that you've went through, your opinion on the game, uh, especially within the US in particular. Um, and but I think uh, before we go any further, as you know, we are in this situation of uh, COVID nineteen, which has kind of brought the whole world to a stop, lockdown, uh, especially this game that we love. Um, how's it been, obviously, for you and, and and for your family, more importantly? Look, it's it's unprecedented. Uh, all the things you can say about the difficulties of of ironically being stuck at home and, and having more time on your hands than you've ever had. Right. Uh, it, it's very, very difficult, especially for us because we're, we're like energizer bunnies and we just need to get that energy out and we need to go do things and we need to go run and train. And uh, when you can't do that, it feels a little uh, like you're handcuffed. But for me, for the, for the family side of it, it's actually been unbelievable because our career as a professional football or soccer player, you're, you're always on the go, man. And it's, it's never ending and you're riding these waves of game and then recover and then game and you're gone. So we have a, a, an amazing opportunity right now to be together as a family every day. And, and that's something that I'm, I'm trying to really um, not take for granted because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't come around very often. So the positive of it is family time. It's, it's truly amazing. Um, but yeah, for me as the, as the soccer player, if I put on the soccer player hat here, um, it is difficult. It's difficult to find the ability to do the training you want with limited space, with limited um, availability of, of how much you can be outside and uh, parks and all that type of stuff. So it's, it's certainly an exercise in becoming creative and how you continue to train, even though your normal things um, aren't in place. So... I, I can uh, just obviously hear in the background earlier on, you've got a... Uh... Yeah. A new addition to the Trap family. Yes. Uh, how, how has that been then during this period? And I'm sure the missus has, has kind of been delighted for you to maybe be at home and, and kind of help out with a, an extra pair of hands. Abs absolutely. Well, it's funny. So preseason, I hadn't seen them in seven weeks. And when you have a, at the time, three and a half, four month old, seven weeks is a long time. Uh, and, and like I was just touching on the, the, Ability now to see him every single day and have stability in his life has been it's been amazing and I know for my wife as well um, having the family unit together is it makes all the difference it really does so that's been incredible but yeah he's uh he grows every day he does something new every day um, his cheeks get chubbier every day <laughs> so we're uh I'm absolutely loving being a dad and he's uh, he's a handful but it's great to see him um, and be around him so it's it's been amazing that's amazing yeah, and I know, so given the, the current situation, well, I know you mentioned it uh, in regards to fitness and it being difficult. What are you actually doing and how are you, I mean, let's talk about, we're talking about peak athlete now. How are you keeping fit um, so that when things do start back up, you can, you can kick on? Yeah, no, it's, 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 the, it's the dilemma that every player right now in the world has, right, at, that plays at the professional level. It's, 
It's what can you be doing? And I think first and foremost, our club, Inter Miami, has done an amazing job of providing a training program that mimics um, as to the best of their abilities and best of our abilities what we would be doing on field each week, building up to harder sessions on Saturday, a la what a game situation would be like, um, and then tapering on Sunday and then restarting on Monday. So today, for example, um, I did – the Monday assigned training, which is runs at different lengths, sprint distances, all that type of stuff. They've given us um, the GPS pods that we actually wear in training every single day. And we take them home with us. Um, and, and they're able to zero in on high intensity distances, the amount of distance, um, recovery, all those sorts of things that, that really as a professional athlete, you need to stay on top of. Because when you're at this peak of, of full fitness, for example, Every couple of days you take off, every three days or whatever it is, especially in times like this, if you don't take it seriously, you lose way more than you realize. And, and I think it's huge, huge kudos to the club for how they've addressed this, um, not only from a fitness running perspective, but also at home um, lifts and in, in gym programs that allow us to continue to keep our muscle base um, where it needs to be for when, when we get back on the field, which of course that date, we don't know, but um, I've been doing those and I also basically bought my own home gym, <laughs> um, uh, just things that I know will be versatile that don't take up too much space that I can use, um, all the time. And think, and the last part of that, thankfully for us, we're in Miami. I mean, it's warm. You can be outside. You can do all these things without the confines of, of, of limited space. So that's been really nice as well. Yeah. And I think, I mean, knowing you as I know you, I know that there'll be, Lots of ball work involved, and I, I know that uh, that you'll see this as an opportunity to to improve in in areas that that you think, or to keep on top of areas that you think you can work on. Um, sure. But besides that, so so outside of that, from a, a fitness and a and a technical standpoint, um, what what are the club doing? What are they providing you um, now, currently, as as well as the fitness program? Is there anything they're giving you to help? See, this is where I've been probably most impressed with, uh, with how our club's gone about it. So we had a meeting today, for example. It was all the players. Um, and we went we've been going over for the past three, four weeks, as long as we've been out of training, our philosophy and model of play. And each aspect of our game model, we've gone over. So the first part, it was broken down into, from, in my example, just the holding midfielders. And it's analyzing what the role of the holding midfielder is. And we have – Clips from our trainings, clips from our games, clips from Barcelona versus Manchester United in the Champions League final. Like all these different examples of exactly what our role is within our team and, ex and examples of how we can improve and continue to learn while we are away from the game, not away from the field. And since then, we've built up to not only holding midfielders, but to the midfield line. And then ultimately today, we did a, a meeting with the entire team of coordinating in this example, uh, our high pressure tactics. So for me, it's been very stimulating um, because you can run and you can lift and you can touch a soccer ball, but if you don't have that connectivity of what a team brings, you really lose um, some of the stimulation that you would have normally from a training environment. And I think they've done a really good job of trying to continue to keep our minds going about the bigger picture of, of football for us as a team and our, our philosophy um, because you also have to realize that we're a brand new club like Ant said it's a project here in Miami that's just starting off and to to not have valuable time on the field that we as an emerging group need um, this is a, a great way of kind of bridging that gap and I've been very happy to see that. And then just let's kind of keep on the discussion of uh, in, into Miami Will which, you know, you've just recently moved there from Columbus. Um, mm -hmm. it's a, it really is an exciting project. Of course, yeah. David Beckham's name's, you know, attached to it. Uh, yeah. However, what is that like then? Because we, we see players transfer from club to club, but the clubs have been there for many, many years with a coach in place that's been there for a while. It's got kind of a, a, an embedded style or philosophy anyway. But with this, this is completely fresh. Oh, like all new players, new coach, new stadium. So what is that actually like when it's something from like kind of the get-go? It's a breath of fresh air for me. Uh, 
but at the same time, it's so new, <laughs> like truly, I've never experienced anything like that. Um, we have a couple guys on our team that have been a part of Atlanta, for example, those types of um, expansion projects. And I think um, it's exciting. Uh, it's exciting because we are making history. We are writing the story. We are writing what the culture of the club is every day, every day that we have these meetings, every day that we, you do the runs you're supposed to do, you're building something, right? Um, and that may seem small right now. It may just seem like the objective that I need to check off the list for me will today, but ultimately it's, it's something that adds that little puzzle piece or that brick to building a foundation of what inter Miami represents and stands for. And I think it's, it's a great responsibility as a player, um, and, and as a member of the club, because you want it to be successful. And I think the, the thing that has struck me very, very quickly about this place is the professionalism and the ambition of the club as a whole. Um, I mean, I don't think David or Jorge Moss, the other, and the other owners stepped into this, wanting it to be a slow burn process that um, 10 years down the road, then we'll have success. They want to win now and they want to be successful now. And of course there is a process, but, from moment one, it's been about the utmost professionalism and intensity to win and, and produce results in a certain style of play, which I think is amazing. Uh, it's amazing to be a part of something that's so forward thinking and ambitious at the same time. And it's quite refreshing to hear you put it the way you put it. It's like basically yourself, along with the rest of your teammates, the coaching staff, everyone at the club, basically like writing chapter one. Yeah. Or Miami and so in terms of then the incentive for yourself to go and kind of be in that chapter but bring success and silverware I'm sure that's massive obviously as an incentive to yourself and to your teammates yeah I mean I, look on top of having ambitions there's pressure right and I think sometimes in just the world over of, of football we think pressure is this constrictive thing that that can really cause fear anxiety whatever and i think it does bring some of those things but at the same time it also brings your best level and and to have ambition and pressure to perform and to succeed there's nothing more stimulating in sport in my opinion and and being on both sides of it at times in my career of seeing when clubs maybe don't do it the right way or are struggling to to create that spark and then being in a place where it's there every single day, um, you rediscover why you love to play this game. You rediscover why you want to come and, and do this as your job and, um, and you want to learn and all those sorts of things. And I, I found it just very refreshing, truly, um, because, and we were speaking about this a little bit earlier of just, even though we can't be on field, you can still be learning. And this is just another aspect of that, of, of our development as individuals, but also as a club and as coaches and, and so on and so forth. That's, and it's great to hear. Well, it really is. And I've got to mention his name. He's such a, you know, massive iconic name within the game, yeah. David Beckham. You know, he's, uh, I think, uh, the, the co-owner uh, of Inter Miami. And he is, he's just a superstar. You know, what, yeah. he, what he does on the pitch, the stuff that he does, off the pitch as well, the charity work. He's just a he's a he's an absolute football god. <laughs> Let's put it that way. How's he been? Have you have you had much interaction with David uh, since he's kind of, since you've been at the club? And uh, does he get involved meetings, uh, anything like that? What can you tell about his involvement so far? So far, his his involvement has been has been very hands on, in my opinion. I mean, obviously, as owners, you're not at every training session you're not sitting in the, the tactical film stuff but um i mean he's been to a handful of trainings they um we had a wonderful team dinner where they were all there and and for him um i've just been so impressed with uh his attention to detail and like you're saying it the global icon that he is truly i mean he really is like there's not many people in the world that are more recognizable um but then when you when he walks into dinner and he goes around the table and knows everybody's hand, everybody's name and shakes everyone's hand and looks you in the eye. You're like, okay, you're like this global icon that also cares about the people that he's in charge of. And I think as from a management perspective and from a leadership perspective, 
that's been so impressive impressive to me um one little anecdote i thought was super super um telling of not only him but the the ownership in general was we had the first our first home game was coming up um uh, right before the covid-19 yeah. suspension of this of the season and we were about to play LA Galaxy David's old team huge huge marketing for this game all that stuff right um and it was the thursday training before saturday so we're two days away from the game and he and Jorge show up at training, walk onto the field. They are talking personally to all of us players, kind of describing the situation. Here's what's going on. We wanted to be here in person to tell you guys this so you understand like our level of commitment to this as well. And I think that was so telling of it's more than just, hey, we own this club and you guys go do it and whatever. Like it's we're a, they, we say La Familia. We're a family. We're really trying to create a culture of being together all the time and and believing in each other and trusting one another. And that was a huge thing for me to see um, very very early on that that they're actually walking the walk of what they're saying. That's amazing. And just it was interesting what you were saying before, especially the the content that you had been given today, just on the the whole the midfield and so on and. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the question that I have then about that type of content around kind of the player profile for yourself, for that team is, so for a player like yourself, do you set yourself uh, short or long-term targets over the season? And how does that maybe kind of transfer into what the club's target for you is as well? Well, I think, especially in my position, right, I think it's different as a striker or as a, a winger or whatever it may be um, from those, the obvious goal setting types of things, right? Like goals, assists, Numbers. whatever it may be. I think they need to be very position specific. So for me, I'm not going to be in those positions often enough to say, I'm going to, I want to score 10 goals. Sure. You could put that up there, but does that fit within my role in the team? And, and ultimately at, at the professional level, you need to understand more than anything, what your role is in the team. And how that, when done at its highest level or its most efficient level, um, what that looks like. And, and for me, it's more about, okay, how many ball recoveries can I have? How many interceptions, tackle percentage, um, possession uh, percentage, but also progressive possession uh, percentage of, of passes completed. Those types of things are more telling of me playing well and me doing my role to its to the best of its ability. Um, so I really tried to look at those analytics and then say, okay, I want my passing percentage to be 90 plus per game. I want to have five ball recoveries in the uh, attacking half and five in the defending half with seven interceptions a game. And I want my tackle uh, winning percentage at above 75%, something like that. Um, so I look at those metrics each game as, okay, this is telling of me playing well, or this is telling of areas where I need to continue to work and improve. Does that make sense? No, that makes perfect sense. And I think that's what we were kind of gaining is the yeah. type of play that who you are, that kind of ties into the player profile, then how then does it match with the club's philosophy in terms yeah. of then the analytical point of view of like to someone like yourself, what is it that you're looking to target within the game over maybe the course of, the season and so on but yeah though no, that's that explains it all sure and i i mean you you've mentioned i think for everyone that's listening the amount of times you've mentioned the team um goals within a team and and it's quite obvious that you are somebody that's heavily invested in a team um now from you from yourself personally i mean you've you've captained one of the top college teams in america obviously were very, very successful. You captained an MLS team from a young age and you were obviously the youngest player to ever captain an MLS team at the time. Uh, you might still be. I don't know if that's changed. Uh, but you've also, <laughs> you've also captained the, the national team. And, and not, I mean, we're, we're talking, you've captained them against big, big team. You, you, obviously, you walked out against France before the before they played in the World Cup and won it. But you, you've, you've obviously got some qualities. You possess something that stands out 
um, for you to be selected as a captain in several different teams here. But what for you, what, what are the, the key attributes that you possess to give so many coaches um, faith in your ability to lead a group? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, the, the way I went about it and the way I've, I've kind of circled my mind around why um, has come to a few points. And I think the first one is understanding who you are first and foremost. Like, who are you as a person? Who are you when you step on the field? Are you uh, a lead by example person? Are you someone that gets um, very passionate about things? And, and then understanding that the best way for you to lead people in any regard is to be yourself. And I struggled with this because we grow up, we watch the game, you see John Terry and you think that is the, the, like the perennial captain or you see Steven Gerrard and you think that every quality that they have, I need to somehow like be the exact same. And, and I think to an extent, yes, you can learn from other captains and you can implement some things. But at the same time, if it's inauthentic to who you are and what your strengths are, then it, it won't work as well as it can. So for me, what I found is I'm, I'm best and I play my best when I am supporting my teammates. When I think about, okay, here's my number 10 that plays in front of me and he wants the ball. How can I make him successful? And by doing that, I, I take kind of the onus and thought off my own performance and I actually play better. I, 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 I'm more geared toward helping people and serving them and by serving them, like, they get to bring out their best qualities, which help the team win. And I think over the course of my career, coaches have seen that um, supplier nature of, of my personality um, as, as something that builds confidence into the group and, and really allows the team to perform at its best uh, when I'm doing it at, a, at my best. So it's, it's just finding your way through who you are as a person and then putting those things into practice every single day of saying, okay, it's okay that I can only do these things and I'm good at these things. So just do them. It's no problem. You don't have to be good at every single thing because a team compensates for people's strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. And I, I mean, you've, you've actually answered one of the other questions. I was actually, I was going to ask you the biggest challenges as a, as a, as a figure and a leader in, within the group, which you've, you've touched on, which is brilliant, but I'll move on. Um, Still within that, that lead role, um, obviously growing up, you grew up in, in uh, Columbus, Ohio, and um, for any kid that's playing soccer, I think it's always a big thing watching your country. Um, but for you, uh, as we've mentioned, you've captained your country and, and several times, but that very first time that you were told, hey, Will, you're going to lead your country out today. Um, how were you informed? And I mean, what, <laughs> what went through your mind at that moment? Yeah, it was a um, it was a friendly against Bosnia. We were in LA, um, and this was a for m majority of MLS guys. We have what's called a January camp every January, where we're starting our preseason. And the national team gets together for the whole month of January, and then usually you have a game at the end of that camp. Um, and we were. We had been in the January camp, and this was the last, the culminating send off, and we were playing Bosnia. And um, it was the night before the game, and we had a team meeting. We were going over kind of a scout, as well as here's what our lineup will be. Um, and and Dave Sarakin, the coach at the time, um, had my name up there. And and it's funny, you you can be so entrenched in like, I've just been in this environment for a month, and these are my teammates, and we're it feels a little false. You don't really think about the grander scope of what this, what this moment means um, because you've just been in soccer training mode for a month. Right. Um, but then you see your name up there and, and I, I had to sit and reflect afterwards because right away it was like the nervous bubbles in your stomach of like, Oh wow, that's pretty cool. But I can't even process this um, until I think I got back to my hotel room and I was sitting there thinking, it's like, okay, our country has 300 and, 30, 340 million people. They selected 30 of us to be at this camp to play this sport. And then they've selected 11 players to play in the game. And then they've selected one guy to be the one that walks the team out. And it was like, whoa, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> um, that, that, 
that responsibility fell on me. Um, and look, playing for your country is as good as it gets, period. There's nothing, there's no greater honor in my opinion. There's nothing more um, humbling, to be honest. And on top of it, for the coach and for your teammates to look to you to be the one that wears the armband is like, uh, words. it's hard to put words to it. And, I mean, you, Dave, you were there, actually, funny enough, the game where we were in Lyon before we played, um, before France went to the World Cup, um, and we played them. And, I mean, that environment, that game for me was to walk out, Hugo Lloris is on the other side, you're looking at the players on the other side of the field, and it's just – it's just crazy that you're there, first of all, because you dream about it your whole career, right? I remember watching the 2002 World Cup um, and reenacting goals that were – every goal that was scored in the World Cup with my brother in the backyard as I was like an eight-year-old. Was he and, in goal? Yeah, you just dream <laughs> well, about maybe being a professional, let alone playing for your country. Um, and then to be the one that is like the leader, yeah, um, I don't know what to say. I, I don't. Yeah. And I know, I mean, I, we mentioned, I, so that, you see it on Twitter. Um, so the Bosnia game, it obviously got put on Twitter that, that there's your jersey and there's the armband. Um, and all yeah. your, your family on social media. Um, I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's obviously a, a group of people that um, have followed you and, and I think always will. Um, but I think that moment for would mean so much for your family as well, which, and I and I know it still does. Um, so, with with the US, we'll, we'll kind of stick on that topic a little bit um, because you know you've mentioned the amount of people in the country. You've mentioned obviously with representing the country um, for the US to to continue to grow um, and improve. What? What do you think needs to happen? What would you suggest? What, what, what are your thoughts on that? It's a, man, it's a difficult one. I mean, it, I know the, the debates rage and, and rage across our country all the time um, about what's the best method of identifying players, training players, what do we play a 4-3-3, three, three, all these things, right? And it's, it's very difficult. I would say it's very difficult for U.S. soccer um, to try to wrestle with all of these issues, right? Um, and for me, I think what our country does so well um, in other sports, for example, if I look at basketball as a perfect example, like think about how many basketball hoops we have in basketball courts and all these, like people just play basketball, right? And then ultimately the cream rises to the top and the best basketball players in the world, for the most part, majority, come from the United States, right? Um, because you just play it and, and you weed out and you continue to refine, refine, refine until we have um, a pipeline system that, that really identifies the best basketball players in the world and then they go to the NBA. Uh, and I think in soccer, it's, it's such a, a difficult sport to, to bring together that pipeline because it's, there's rec basketball, I mean, rec soccer, there's club soccer, there's academy soccer, there's all these different pipelines that, players just get lost, right? I mean, I know we had a, a kid in Columbus that was playing Sunday league soccer, had never played organized soccer until he was about 13 years old because he moved over from Cameroon and now played in the U20 World Cup this past year and has started multiple games at, at, a, at the professional level. And you're like, okay, well, that's – there's a there's a undergrowth of, of players that are just not identified, I think, in our country. And that's a serious, serious problem, whether it's the uh, – um, monetary issues of not being able to pay um, or the identification process of, of where scouts are going to find these players. Um, I don't know how you exactly change these, these infrastructure issues we have. Um, but ultimately I think we have a huge responsibility and opportunity as, as coaches and as professional players to inspire young, young players to, not only see soccer as an outlet for them to see it as a positive thing for um, their families, for friendship, for um, in, in many ways, economic stability in the future. Um, but also just the beauty of the game. I, I think we have a, a real issue with um, the general public understanding the beauty of the sport that we play. Uh, for me, the subtlety, it's, it's fun when I, I sit down with some of my cousins who Dave knows, 
quite well um, that football, whole, their entire lives, American football, right? And when I get on and I get passionate as we talk more and more about the game, right? And we're talking about soccer and I'm describing just the subtle intricacies of, of soccer and how this free flowing game that we, that we play in coaches is, is so beautiful when it unfolds and it's so unpredictable. And I could see their faces light up as mine is like lighting up. And I think we need to find a way to bring that to people more and more and more. Um, I guess that's a romantic idea, but it's, it's something that no other sport in the world can, can do what, what our sport does. And I think that's, that needs to reach people um, in a more mainline way. Yeah. And you, you go on, I'm sorry. You... I'm just, no, carry on David's because, my question will kind of follow on to probably what you're going to say. Because I know you, I know you've you mentioned. I mean, the amount of times in that those sentences, and you mentioned the importance of play. Um, yeah. And you know, it's a sport. I think um, it's something that's supposed to be enjoyed. Um, but that that was something. I mean, you know, when you to hear you talk about the passion of it and just the importance of enjoying it, the importance of playing. Um, because at the end of the day, it is something that's supposed to be played to have fun and to enjoy yourself. Um, and I mean, with you, um, you obviously grew up uh, playing the sport, enjoying it, and you've you've got yourself to a to a point where you've had a you've had a, a great career so far. Um, you've achieved a lot of things and. At the same time, though, you've, you've faced and overcome challenges that maybe other people may not have done in their careers. And, and I look at, for me, for example, I'm going to look at um, the period where you were out. You had, I know you, so you had a concussion um, in 2015. And, um, you were out for a while and, and there's, there were a lot of issues within that. But for you, um, whenever you've had setbacks, whether it be this concussion uh, or something else, what are the keys for you to stay in focused on what the goal is and what it is you want to achieve? Yeah. First of all, I think too often we only think about setbacks as, as injuries in our sport. I think too often that, that is like the first thought for people is, oh, well, he's had injuries. And, and yes, those are setbacks. Um, but Ultimately, I think like you fail every day. You fail every game. You fail. I mean, you're disappointed all the time. Like it, it's just part of of what sport is and what soccer is. And I think for me, what I've grown to learn. And look, like I said, it takes a lot of failure to get to this point where you're you kind of have the hindsight to look back and say, "Oh wow, I actually did learn a lot in these failures." Um, that persistence is probably one of the greatest qualities you can have in anything, but especially in sport, especially in, in soccer. Because if you're willing to, even though you screw up and even though things aren't going as well as you want, to continue to work and continue to keep your eye on what you want, eventually the dam breaks and things start to go your way. But too often, I think, we want it bad and then it doesn't turn out right away or turn out the way we wanted it to, to be. And then we just kind of give up. And, and for me, I look at 2015 as a very formative time for me because for almost three months, I, I couldn't play. Um, I didn't know, am I ever going to get better? My head feels, feels off. I, my vision is off. My mental processes don't feel right. I just didn't feel like myself for over three months. And when, when you're walking down the street and you don't have to be at a peak level of athletic performance, that may not be an issue. But as soon as I got on a field and I have to perform and, and execute a, a, a job at a high level, I couldn't do it. And for me, it was, it was very, very difficult because this is who I've rested my identity on for a long time. And, and I learned that, okay, yes, Will Trap, the soccer player, is, is a big part of who I am, but it's not all who I am, right? So there's a lot of soul-searching, a lot of things you learn about yourself amidst challenges, not only injuries, but just difficulties, um, whether it's, it's losing a game, whether it's being cut from a team, whether it's um, 
not making the starting 11, whatever it is, there's, there's always something to be learned. Um, and, and ultimately it's those difficulties that actually push you past the ones that maybe made it to begin with the ones that had it easier, the ones that have to str- like struggle and strive and push and persist. They're the ones that, that make it, um, and, and have the lasting scars that have turned into something that, that shows where they've been and, and, and the success they've had from it. Yeah. Can I just jump in there then quick, Will? I think it's, it's really good to hear just about a little bit of your, your characteristic about who you stand for and why it's propelled you within the game. Looking back, let's just say you as a, a 13-year-old, uh, whenever you were playing the game uh, at that point in time, and like probably many of us, we were probably playing with players that like, probably had more talent and more technique than us, but for whatever reason it kind of didn't go their way for, for, for many different reasons. Sure. What kind of propelled you maybe as a 13, 14 year old to kind of just stick on, you know, stick on the journey, stick on the track and like kind of got you across the line and got you the achievements, what you've achieved so far? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think for myself, what would continue to push me was just, I had a dream that I wanted to be a professional. And I wanted to, I wanted to do these things and maybe I'm not the most athletic. Maybe I'm not the biggest, strongest, fastest, whatever. Um, but I knew that to go back to what I was speaking about earlier about who, who I am and what my strengths are. And I just said, okay, all I can control is those things. Can I just get better at those things? Because I'm only going to be five foot nine. I'm not going to be six foot four. So how do I adapt my game to continue to, to be effective? Um, and, and ultimately you start to find that the things that you're good at are the most fun to work on, <laughs> to be honest. And yes, you have to work on things that you're not good at as well, but, um, understanding who you are and then having that goal in mind of, man, like this sucks and this is hard. And the coach is mad at me and, and Dave and I could probably talk about times in college where it was, it, it was downright unbearable and you didn't want, you didn't think you you wanted to play anymore and you just found it in yourself that okay the the resistance or the fear that I'm feeling now is less than how much I want the ultimate end goal and what the end goal is 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 going to be worth this and that's a daily thing and that's what's crazy like it may not just be in the big moments of struggle in the big moments of of blow-ups and combativeness it's every day waking up and saying man I I have to go do this today and I want to go do this today. And I want to, to find that 1% to improve on. Um, and, and if you start to do that, especially at 12, 13 years old, you're going to be building a habit. That's, that's going to push you well beyond what you thought was possible for yourself. Do you know what? That's, that's brilliant to hear. Well, talking about your kind of your strengths so early on within your career and just continue to work on your strengths because how many times do we come across, coaches and, and players that will tend to work on let's just say improvement areas or let's just say weaknesses that let's just get you know whatever it may be where it's like okay well i'm going to work on something that's currently a two out of ten within my game and you're thinking well are you potentially taking the time away from making you the, the things that you're good at which is currently a seven out of ten to make it an eight or nine out of ten which then could potentially take you through the journey of being something within this game. So, so it's, no, it's brilliant to hear that yeah, you, do, you did focus on your profile. You, you were very aware of what type of player you could potentially be physically as well. So, no, brilliant to hear that. And I think, I mean, to, to add on to that, so I think for, for you, Will, I know one of your strengths, it's, it's quite a funny story, one of your strengths is your passing ability um, and I wrote uh, incredible so you look at this you look at this story for those listening that you've got someone that's captain the national team um, you've got somebody that's that's playing in the MLS he, he's at the top of his game um, um, it was I, I was in Columbus for Julie for your sister's wedding yeah and I was in Columbus for one week and during that week every day um, you put your boots on and you went to your old high school, old high school. So Gahanna Lincoln high school, Will goes. And I went with you and 
Will is working on passing um, when Will is a passer. So his best attribute is passing, but we, we were out. I mean, there was one day, we, we must have been out for three hours. Um, and I remember getting back to the house. Um, and obviously- Well, sore? Yeah, I, oh, I was sore. I had blisters. <laughs> um, you probably not so much, but uh, we spent about three hours working on something um, that is probably your best attribute. Um, or one of your best attributes, and I think that's such a telling thing that was it. Know, was it not your best attribute, David? Uh, I don't have any best attributes. Now. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> it's one of Will's, um, but that was. I think it's it's just a great story for people to listen to to go well to hit to know that somebody like yourself is still going out to your old high school, where you really grew up and where you grew as a, as a person. And you're working on something that you're already efficient at and good at. Um, sure. But I think, I mean, with that, so, I mean, we, we've touched on it a lot um, as about your success as a, as a professional player. Um, but you, obviously education is important. And, uh, and we know, obviously, you high school, you then went to Akron. Um, what, what, what value do you put on the importance of education, even now as a professional player? Yeah. Um, so for, for me, I don't know. I'm, I'm a highly competitive person within myself. Like <clears throat> I'm always trying to push myself to better whatever I just did. Right. So, um, and, and I think I, I aim to please in many regards. So in school, I was always like, I want to get all A's. I just wanted to get straight A's and, because I want to be competitive to, within myself, but also my, I want to please my teachers. I want to please my parents and those sorts of things. Um, so I always found school as something that I, I liked to be smart and know things. Like, I, I just think it's really important that you should be able to have conversations with, with people and, and talk about things beyond just soccer. And, and look, it's soccer is amazing and we love to talk about it. And I think, the more you study other things, the more connections you see with soccer. Um, so for me, education was something that um, pushed my mind to, to continue to grow and to, co to continue to make connections um, in, in new creative ways. And I actually just graduated this past December from, from Akron. Um, and, and I was, and look, I don't know what the value of a college degree really is anymore, but for me, I thought the, the idea of, of accomplishing that was, was really important for, um, for me and what, for what I did and, and education of, of your mind and, and growth and, and keeping yourself sharp. Um, you have to do it. I mean, you do like, it's just, and you may not be great at it. It may not be the easiest thing that comes to you, but certainly working at it will help you in other realms of your life. If, if you're working hard in school and, it's not easy for you. Maybe that translates into you working harder at soccer and being even better than what you thought you could be. And, and those types of connections that we often just compartmentalize school, soccer, family, it, they're all connected in, in so many ways. And those lessons that you find in one can be translated into the others. Yeah. And I, I mean, I don't think, <clears throat> I don't think I ever have done, but I would actually like to thank you. Might as well do it Four. now on the topic of education. For uh, what? Well, I, I, did, I was good in school. I did well. Um, I wasn't very good at algebra. And freshman uh, year, um, yeah. Mr. Trapp, uh, I went to his freshman dorm pretty much every night. And he, he got me through intermediate algebra. Without you, I wouldn't have done it. So I just want to thank you. I, haven't, I don't think That's I ever really have. Sorry. Um, no, you but, haven't. Well, thank you. Was, uh, have, you, have you ever used algebra ever since? <laughs> well, I actually needed to pass another algebra class afterwards and it wasn't <laughs> there. It is. There no. it is, yeah. But no, I haven't. But no, it's, that, that's brilliant. Um, and I, I mean, you've, you've, you've obviously touched on, a, on the importance of a player, um, the importance of education. But for you now, so uh, 27, and you've, you've achieved a lot. Knowing what you know now, if you were to look back, uh, if you could give any advice to young players that are on their soccer journey, 
um, just one nugget of information, what would it be? Wow. So a lot of the things we, we touched on, um, they, they came to me a little late. I wish I would have known them at 12, 13. And I think you have, I had a semblance of them, but I didn't know them as well as I do now. Um, the idea of, oh man, understanding your strengths, I think is, is a theme we've been going over. Understanding your strengths and, and what makes you the best soccer player you can be. I think you really need to take the time and, and, and understand yourself and look at yourself and, and say, okay, I'm really good at passing the ball or I'm really good at, at tackling and reading the game and, and, and being in the right position all the time. I'm good at those things. How can I be even better? Who in the world does it the best and how can I watch and learn from them? Because I think for me, um, I feel like I, I lost time with some of those lessons. Um, I lost time. I wish I would have, maybe taken it to heart at a, at a younger age and then consulted with people that could push those things more, um, whether it be coaches like yourselves who, who have a better understanding. It can, it can push you in ways that maybe you didn't think. Because I did a lot of stuff on my own, to be honest. I thought I knew who I was as a player. I watched a lot of games on TV, but I never had that like coach that maybe could could bring those out of me at a, at a young, young age. And I, a lot of it was done just piecemeal of, okay, I'm going to try this out and try this out and try this out. So I think finding mentors is, is, is a really important part of your process as young players. Um, once you understand who you are as a player and what your strengths are, then it's like seeking out the people that are, are smarter than you ultimately and learn from them and, and, not, and don't take it personally and just take it as something that this is helping you on your journey forward and you'll love them for it as you, as you get further along. Um, so I've been fortunate to have coaches that maybe at the professional level did that for me. Um, but if you can get that at a younger age, you're going to be, you're going to be flying by the time you're 16, 17, 18 years old. And I, I know, um, you, are, cause you, you have, um, the coaches that you work with. I know, it's a great point um, around having the mentors and having people around you. Cause I know even, even now you, you have that in your life uh, uh, at the level that you're at, you, you are still consulting with people and speaking to them. So I think that's amazing. So look, we're going to take a, a, a bit of a left turn on this. Um, I, this is question, I guess, as a parent <laughs> now. Um, and I know we've touched on it. You've, you've got, uh, young, young son, who yep. is the light of your life now, um, and and I know for you, um, I know how important your family are to you, um, and I know what they brought to your life um, in the nine years that we've known each other, um, and now obviously you're a parent yourself. Uh, what advice, if any, would you give to parents? to help the kid on the journey as a, not just as a soccer player, but also as a person. Hmm. Well, it's interesting. I think on the first side of it, I could never understand soccer parents before I had a kid. I, I, I just remember I refed a game. Maybe I was scarred because I was a, a, a linesman in a, in a game and it was like, three-year-olds or four-year-olds and I got more crap from these parents than I had ever gotten in my life I'm like dude these kids don't even know what's going on like they're just kicking a ball around like who cares but their level of commitment I, I didn't understand but now having having our son um, I think what's so important and, and lessons I take from my parents of, of things that they did for me that maybe I wasn't aware of um, when I was younger but now see it they were so supportive of whatever I wanted to do and not supportive of you're always right and everything's great. Will, but supportive in the sense of, Hey, like if, if you want to do this, we're going to help you do this and we're going to do it in a way that isn't easy and isn't the shortcut, but is going to, to make you be a better teammate. Like my dad used to give me, 50 cents for an assist and 25 cents for a goal. So from age five, six, whatever, when I started playing, he always valued 
assists more than, than goals. He thought, hey, if you are providing for your teammates and you're helping them, there's more in that than, than the glory for yourself. And it's funny because now as I look at my game, it's something that I think that way all the time. And maybe at age six, he instilled a, a foundational principle in, in my life and in my game that um, sticks with me today. I don't know. But um, the idea of them wanting me to succeed, but wanting me to succeed in a way that wasn't get rich fast. It was very much about, hey, Will, here, we're going to help you along this. We're going to push you to, to, to grow, but we're not just going to hand it to you because no one will hand it to you in your life. It's going to be difficult. Um, and, and preparing your kids for that. Um, as, as best you can of saying hard work is, is bare minimum essential. Um, perseverance is essential. Um, those things, treating your teammates and your, yourself and your coaches with respect is essential. Um, be a good person, be humble, sacrifice. Um, and, and things will, will work out for you. They really do. I mean, I think those are foundational principles just as people that I think as a parent, you have to try to push into your kid. Um, and, and, and create those situations where they learn that on their own as well. Um, because like I talked, I touched on earlier, the, the transitive nature of, of lessons in sport and family and education, the, they all work. I mean, they all blend together and, and you can teach kids those things. Brilliant. And just with that as well, um, I think this is not just, you know, something I think that we need to do more just in, in the US, but I think this is maybe something that we need to do more kind of worldwide is, is possibly the parents' education on something like youth development, what mm -hmm. youth development looks like. You come across many parents that are attached to a coach rather than the whole club, the project, the philosophy, and mm -hmm. time and time again, the coach leaves, the players leave, or the team leave with the coach and so on. But, yeah, so do you feel like... There could be maybe more kind of resources potentially given to parents just around what kind of youth development looks like from a from a really young age, from as you said before, uh, like three, four year olds that are playing, and then you're hearing all kinds of different shouts from the side of the field. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think there needs to be some form of of educational resources that kind of show a logical progression of, okay, at this age, we want to be instilling these principles. We want to be teaching your kids this. We want a plan, right? A plan that makes sense. And, and I'm sure clubs do this. Look, it's been a long time since I've been in the youth, in the youth club environment, but for parents to understand that, yes, like we are here to help your son or daughter improve. And winning might not, and that's a cliche that's thrown around a lot. It's, like it's not all about winning, but at the same time, like kids need to know that at the professional level, it is a lot about winning. Like yeah. you can't just sit there and say like, we just want only process or only results. Um, and, and for parents to be educated at, a, at their kids' young ages to understand how these two things blend together and how the club is trying to make this work. Um, because at the professional level, the clubs have issues with that all the time and different philosophies are thrown out and some players leave and some players come in and some are more process orientated and more results orientated. And I think um, to, to have, I know for me as a player to have the clarity of this is why we're doing things yeah. is so important. It's so important because you, you need to have the clarity of, of what's the motivation for this? What's the reasoning for for what you coaches are doing in this club. Yeah, I totally get that. I think it's definitely something, that, again, worldwide, I think it's something that we could potentially kind of give more in terms of support and rather than point the finger, let's educate instead. Yeah. But asking you now, Will, to, to maybe keep your kind of parent cap on now, uh, tell us a little bit of something about like the Will chat that we don't know, away from the pitch, away from into Miami, away from the training yeah. field. What kind of things do you actually enjoy when, when it's not COVID-19? <laughs> yeah. When you are allow, allowed outside. You know, tell me okay. a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so for me, man, it's – and Dave can probably touch on some of this, but um, I love to sing. I'm a big singer. Can, um, you, can you give us a, 
We might, no, we might. I've been singing too. I've, I've had a few <laughs> interviews lately and I've been singing too much and I got a, lo a lot of stick from some of the boys. So I, I've just been trying to cut back a little bit. Just um, on did, did, test you, for that. Did, you have <laughs> did you have to sing a song when you signed for the uh, Inter Miami? I did. I did. Well, I didn't have to, but they, they asked me to and I didn't refuse. What so, was the song? I, on. What was uh, the song? I sang my rendition of Dr. Dre and Black Street's um, No Diggity. Wow. Yep. So the, the white boy, the white boy acoustic version is what I did, what I gave. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I really enjoy singing. My family, my whole family sings. Um, music, is like, in coupled with that, music is a big part of our lives. So um, I always have speakers on with music. We do like a little right before Theo's um, five o'clock, five thirty uh, dinner time. We do like a dance party now with them, uh, which is pretty fun. Uh, my wife and I, we love to travel. Um, we, we've been very fortunate that um, we've had the means and the, the resources to, to see the world in a lot of different ways and experience different cultures. So um, that's a big part of, of who I am and what I like to do. I'm, a, I'm into fashion. I do like clothing and reading and learning about um, that side of business. And, and I've actually been able to meet a lot of interesting, cool people from, through my job and the platform I have in that sector of the world um yeah what else i don't know i mean it, i i honestly love soccer it's kind of funny like i don't play other sports i don't really watch other sports that much unless lebron james is playing because i'm a huge lebron james fan um but that's about it like it's it's a lot of just soccer and then hanging out with family and, and pretty reserved with with what we what we do at home so you just basically soccer through and through well let's let's play. yeah yeah um, yeah. Well, I will say I'm a tennis fan. I like Roger Federer too, so I'll watch tennis too. Not a bad athlete. To think not a bad, not a bad athlete there. Not a bad athlete at all. And and something that we do at Seven Elite Academy, and something that what we stand for, will and just to kind of give you a little bit of the insight into kind of our project. Uh, we have values. Pretty sure that you've been across kind of club values with Columbus, with the with the U.S. national team, and now uh, into Miami. Uh, we have values that kind of stand for ethics, and we, we have um, excellence, tenacity, honor, innovation, community, and sacrifice. And we, and we try to instill and embed them values within all our, not just our players, but all our staff, everyone that's connected with the club to, to kind of buy in. I would say them values, is there any that kind of stand out for you, Will, in terms of maybe who you are as a person and as a player? I want to say that I, I try to exude and, and be a part of every single one of those. Um, and there's some that I think now in a new environment that have come out more tenacity being one. I think the way we train here in Miami, the way our, our coaches, there's so much more passion that is thrown into the game. And it's, it, for me, it's been amazing to, to see tenacity come through my training habits and my game habits more and more. Um, but all of those, I mean, sacrifice you just look at sacrifice what did we talk about earlier of of being a good teammate of, of serving your your um your teammates your coaches and and being humble i mean these 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 codes of ethics um if you put them into practice every day if you if you truly try to ingrain them into yourself you're going to have success and and i think for me um i try i try to be as um as forthright with all those things as possible. Sure, you you don't always get it right, but um, the more you're you're pushing toward that, uh, the more success you have. But but also the the more you affect people and influence people in in ways than you realize, because we're attracted to people that that sometimes we can't even explain why they're magnetic, but they have a, a certain quality to them. And I think those. Um, those ethics that you guys hold as a club are, are a lot of the qualities that we look at in people that we revere highly. And, Will, this is the last big question. And what I'm going to say to you, yeah, get your guns out. Get the guns out. <laughs> you can't hold back on this one at all. Tell me then what David Mayer was actually like as a teammate. Oh, man. Well, I'll put it this way. When we first started, we all got our heads shaved. We were freshmen, so it was like a little bit of a hazing thing. And I've never seen a creepier-looking guy with his head shaved. But, well, 
he got a bad haircut before he had to shave it. But man, what a scary looking guy for a little bit there. <laughs> um, but no, as a teammate, you know, Dave, Dave, David was wonderful. Um, his, his qualities on the field, I think, were outshined at times by who he is as a person. Now I'm being nice. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't have a whole lot of punches to throw because he's one of my best friends. And truly, I don't have much stick to say to him other than when he transferred from Akron to Charlotte, who actually beat us in the playoffs that year. I was a little annoyed for him for about two and a half to three months where I couldn't even listen to a word he was saying. <laughs> um, but truly, I mean, a, a, a stand-up a stand up teammate in every sense of the word. I mean, someone that there's a reason why I was drawn to him. And like, well, like we were just saying from a magnetic perspective, he, he was someone that had a high code of ethics from, from a young age and, and brought his teammates up along with him. Um, and when it wasn't, well, it's funny, we're in Florida. One of the funniest things I've ever seen of this guy was we played in Florida and it was about 90 degrees and you English people don't, don't do so well in the heat. Uh, and I think it was maybe 20 minutes in where he needed a sub and had a cold towel around his head um, for the rest of the game. <laughs> but then it was blamed on asthma or something. I don't know. I don't know. That's just hearsay. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's um, Dave's Dave's amazing, amazing. You guys are lucky to have him for sure. Dave, you've you've been you've been given a, an easy one there. Oh. I was expecting a little bit more. Some more I know. Before. I know. That that no, that's great. Well, thank you for sharing that. And and before we wrap up our our masterclass session with yourself, and this, by the way, will has been brilliant uh for myself i'm sure for david who who knows you well but to all our listeners this has been like tremendous um but before we finish we want to hit you with some quick fire questions uh are you ready for this let's do it okay so i'm gonna hit you some with questions a little bit about football but a little bit about other stuff as well so first question is favorite soccer player as a child as a child, my favorite player was – man, Ronaldinho was at his, his, at his height. I would say it was him or Paul Scholes. What an answer. Yeah. It's not bad. Ronaldinho yeah. was a yeah. game. Okay, favorite soccer player now? Uh, Sergio Busquets. Probably based around your, your own position? Yeah. Yeah, I have to. Every every time Bar I record every Barcelona game, honestly, just so I can watch him. But Messi's there too. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't okay. hurt. <laughs> Favorite athlete of all time? Ooh. Um, I want to put LeBron. LeBron. Okay. Ohio boy. Favorite hobby outside soccer? I think we already know this. I think singing is singing is probably there. Singing and just music in general. Great. Favorite food? Honestly, give me like a, a, a ribeye steak or a filet mignon, and I'm like, I'm good. Wagyu, a little Wagyu beef, if you're getting fancy, that's really nice. But honestly, just a ribeye would be great. You're making me hungry now, Will. I know. <laughs> Favorite film? Favorite film is Dark Knight Rises, the Batman movie. Good choice. Good, good choice. Favorite song? My favorite song is, uh, I answered this recently. It's called Postcards from Hell by the Wood Brothers. Uh, I don't know why. It's just one of those songs. Every time I hear it, I have to, I have to listen to it and sing it all the way through. Um, it's a fantastic song. And then the last one is, if you wasn't a soccer player, what would you be? Ooh. Well, it's topical at the moment. When I, went, when I first went to school, I was pre-med, um, and I wanted to be uh, something in the medical field, potentially a doctor. So maybe, maybe something like that, but that's not going to be it now. Um, after my career, I don't know if I want to be a coach, if I want to um, be a motivational speaker, if I want to do any of those things. Who knows? But I, was, I wanted to be a doctor initially. Brilliant. Will... That kind of concludes our kind of masterclass session with Seven Elite Academy online. Uh, listen, we want to thank you so much. Um, and from myself, and I'm sure from David, we, we really wish you, you know, the very best um, 
when, once this all kind of clears up and you, you're back out there doing, you know, what you do. And uh, we do, we truly wish you, you know, the best uh, into Miami. We hope you go on to have a great season for when it resumes. And uh, yeah, thank you very much, Will. And uh, it's been a real honour, it's been a real pleasure. Anything from yourself, David? No, I, I mean, obviously from a, a professional standpoint and a, and a personal standpoint, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I, I know the value, <clears throat> the value that you'll have brought to, to people that are listening. I, I don't think you can put words on it. Um, so personally, I just want to thank you as well. It's been absolutely incredible. The answers have been top draw. Well, thanks guys. This has been, this has been amazing. And, um, thanks for thinking of me. Thanks for giving me a little bit of a, uh, something else to do at the house. Um, but honestly, I, I wish you guys all the luck, um, all your, all your players, all your parents out there that are listening. Um, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to listen and, um, and for having me on guys.